This is Radio RSA, the voice of South Africa. We present Umzingeli, the story of poaching in Swaziland. In a country the size of Swaziland, bush clearing has had to be extensive to make way for agriculture. This depleted the once teeming herds of game so drastically that a final refuge had to be created for the survivors of the country's decimated wildlife population. As with many Africans, the Swazi woman tilled the fields and the man was Umzingeli, the hunter. His hunting grounds used to be extensive when game was abundant. But the pace of Swaziland's progress has quickened and civilization has encroached. His meat is harder to come by. With the proclamation of game sanctuaries, it's easier now to hunt where there's a concentration of animals and the hunter becomes a poacher. Paul Bosman, like so many of us, spends most of his day behind a desk in the city. But he's a keen naturalist, and his wife and two young sons share his love of nature. So, holidays and long weekends are generally spent in one of the game reserves. During a recent long weekend, we decided to visit our friends Terence Riley and Liz Reynolds at Nilwan Game Sanctuary in the Malkerns Valley of Swaziland. Terry, a former game ranger and veteran of Operation Noah, decided to turn his family farm into a game reserve. He persevered in the face of tremendous opposition and with Liz as a constant helper has turned it into the delightful place it is today. The once teeming herds of Swaziland's wildlife are now well represented in the sanctuary. I asked Terry how he was coping with poachers, a ranger's constant headache. At a new one, poaching is no longer a very potent question, it seems to have been nipped, as it were, in that the magistrate of this particular district has shown us a tremendous amount of sympathy and has given us adequate court sentences. In fact, our last poaching case was over a year ago, and the accused for having snared a warthog in the sanctuary and was convicted and sentenced to two years' imprisonment. Poaching, though virtually eliminated at Nilwan, is still a problem at Shlani. In addition to having his own reserve, Terry is also ranger of Shlani, a sanctuary situated in the northeastern corner of Swaziland, at the foothills of the Lebombos. Poachers come into this area to lay their snares, and the most common victims are blue wildebeest, impala and zebra. The big danger here is that, particularly in the drought seasons, where you've got a concentration of game around the particular water holes, uh, all the game congregates there to drink, and all the perches congregate there to set their snares. And as often as not, the water points are completely surrounded by snares in such a fashion that it is not possible, not physically possible for any animal to get to water without being caught up. And at times such as these, uh, of course, you can lose anything up to a hundred animals in a night quite easily. Then, of course, uh, the quantity of meat is such that it cannot all be taken away. These chaps come in with donkeys sometimes and they carry a certain amount away. But vast quantities of meat are just left to rot, left for the vultures. I was curious. Did these people poach for their own family consumption or on a commercial scale? A lot of the meat down there has been commercialized. There are many sort of country butcheries involved in accepting poached game meat and it's become quite a business. Many will perch for a meal, but in perching for a meal, um, they'll obviously not set a single snare. 
to set a single snare in the bush belt down there, it might take months for that particular snare to catch an animal. So what they do, they come in and set 20 or 30, or even as many as one, as a hundred, and the first animal caught, they take. Whatever snares are left, are left to kill at a later date. They're just as effective in a year or two years' time as they are the day they set. And of course this is where um, tremendous quantities of game are caught over a period of time, and of course it, the meat is all wasted. Terry has kept records of snaring, and a tragic fact that emerges is that less than 1% of all game snared is collected by the poachers. I would say that for every 100 animals snared, caught and killed in snares, probably half an animal is recovered and used. This is how wasteful snaring is. And we've been very careful about assessing these figures. We've taken careful note of all the animals we've found that the vultures have got or the hyenas have got, of the animals we've found that have just been left to rot, and of the animals that have actually been carried away. And in certainty, I can say that it's less than 1% of the animals caught in snares are actually used, carried away and utilized. Terry went on to tell us about yet another method of poaching, shooting at night with a spotlight. It certainly isn't as destructive as snaring, but a poacher who will go out and take a shot at an animal, realizing that the gun he shot with has made a noise, is not going to stand around and follow up the animal if it happens to be wounded. He'll go on to another area and try again. And in this fashion, a lot of game is wounded. Having gathered all these facts and statistics on poaching from Terry, we were most enthusiastic when he suggested that we go down to Schlani to take provisions to the game guards and get some first-hand experience of poacher control. We set out after lunch. Terry, Liz, his assistant, my wife, our two young sons and myself. And by that afternoon, we're camped in the heart of the reserve under a magnificent old Scotia tree. We had to wait until sunset before doing a road patrol. The main road through Swaziland to Mozambique runs through the centre of the reserve, and would-be poachers cruise along after dark using a spotlight to look for game. Until recently, Terry had to watch out for suspiciously slow-moving vehicles, trying to keep them in sight without being detected himself, but had now started using walkie-talkies. To pinpoint the guilty ones, the ones who are bent on poaching, my idea was to place one walkie-talkie at a point on the road where it entered the game reserve and the other on a point where it left the game reserve. The distance is about eight miles apart. These two intercoms could be used to very good effect, I think. Um, any car coming or entering the game reserve would be immediately reported to the other walkie-talkie. It would be timed, and if it took more than, if it hadn't appeared at the point of exit, by a certain time, it was obvious that it had stopped on the way. And apart from having a punch on that road, there's only other, one other reason why a car would stop on the way. The sun soon dropped low into the trees of the beautiful parkland, and we moved off in two jeeps, heading for the main road. Liz driving one, accompanied by three game guards, and the rest of us with Terry. The two vehicles parted company, and we took up a position at the lower end of the highway, where it enters the reserve. We pulled off the road and parked in a donga, surrounded by long grass. Liz, in the meantime, was cutting through the bush to a point some distance further along the road. Radio contact was maintained with her. Terry issuing instructions, sometimes to her and sometimes to one of the game guards. Jimson, Kombisan Gosa Zanin Zela Nyalo, near corner Stau Sangana corner, Ugvila Noguin. Hello, Liz, hello, Liz. Do you read me, Eva? Oh, we can hear you terrifically. We've just crossed over the road again, Eva. 
Where are you? We had to go on the main road, right? Near the King of the Atlanta tree, over. As each car passed, we wondered if this would be the moment of action we were waiting for. But all was well. These motorists seemed bent on reaching some distant destination and the animals were left unmolested. Two hours and many cars later, Terry gave instructions to return to camp. It was a welcome order as we were all cold and very hungry. When we got back to camp, Terry and I stayed on chatting in the warmth of the jeep. Another method of snaring, of course, is by moonlight. Big gangs come in. They hack down the bush and sort of lie it into a, arrange it into a, a, a long obstruction on a known animal route, uh, leaving gaps in it every so often and snaring the gaps. Then, with the aid of dogs, they go around and let the animals get their scent. By this means, with the aid of their dogs, they drive them in the direction of the snares. And in this fashion, many, many animals, dozens of animals, can get caught in a single drive. Come on, you two. Coffee's ready. After a good meal, which always tastes that much better in the bush, we sat around the fire chatting. I was filled with admiration for these two remarkable people. Terry, the dedicated conservationist, who is as fascinated by a dragonfly emerging from its chrysalis as he is by a thundering herd of zebra, who is always eager to stop and explain something to one of the children, to whom all nature is sanctuary and man the intruder. And Liz, his cheerful and able assistant, an attractive and intelligent girl, ready to do a job, be it preparing a meal, driving a jeep, or identifying botanical specimens. We chatted away until well after midnight, and as we rolled out our sleeping bags and pushed the logs further into the fire, Terry casually told us that the game guards had found freshly laid wire snares around a water hole, and that he had planned to ambush these less sophisticated poachers as they came to check the snares at dawn. This had been done on foot in the past, but he had found this thoroughly inadequate. He had now devised a more efficient method of arresting, by using a vehicle. We felt that these poachers running away from the police boys, as they invariably did, just wasn't good enough. And we had used a Land Rover. We do use a Land Rover to catch animals. Why not use it to catch poachers? And the system we devised was to discover the snares on foot, leave men at the snaring site with a rifle, and as soon as the poachers appeared, he just fired a shot. Warning shot. A warning shot. We being a mile or two away in the Land Rover, right out of the snaring area, where our tracks wouldn't be observed or any noise, noise wouldn't be heard, would hear the shot and would simply drive in that direction. Close the gap and he wouldn't stand the chance. And the these chaps had instructions to keep chasing. Terry then told us that anyone not up and ready to move by 4 a.m. would be left behind. Next morning, we were woken by one of the game guards, coffee all round and a quick wash. This time, we were using Jezebel, a short wheelbase vehicle which had been specially modified for speedy bush crashing. Eleven of us piled into Jezebel. Terry, Liz, my wife and our two sons, who were beside themselves with excitement, five game guards and myself. The plan was to drop the game guards near the water hole. They would knock down a couple of snares to give the impression that game had passed through, then hide themselves in the bush, making sure they had a clear view of the snares. We would then proceed to a point about three quarters of a mile away. If the poachers appeared and attempted to reset the snares, the Induna would fire his gun to alert us, while they gave chase on foot. The blowing of their whistles from then on would give us direction. 
We waited for about half an hour in strict silence. It was very cold. We could now see the first signs of dawn. Suddenly, we heard the strange vibrating honk of the wildebeest and realized that they were probably being herded towards the snares. The excitement was intense as we waited, waiting for the gunshot, which would be the signal for action. Or would this be a repetition of last night's fruitless vigil? We could barely see. Thorn bushes ripped our bodies. Grey forms loomed and veered as Terry skillfully manoeuvred the flying jeep. You could, you could bounce right out of it. We crashed our way over logs and dongas. An occasional stop for direction, then back in the chase. We soon caught sight of one of the game guards running only a few paces behind a poacher. And before we could reach them, an arrest had been made. We hastily bundled them both on board, listened for further whistling and resumed the chase. Before long, we had glimpses of a second poacher, weaving like a hare through the bush. There you are. That's up! Slowly we shortened the distance between us until he was only a few yards ahead. His stamina amazed me. He ran on, sidestepping trees at the last minute. Suddenly we realized what his plan was to take us down into the dry riverbed of heavy sand and rocks. One of the game guards jumped off the jeep. There was a flying tackle, a short struggle, and it was all over. We've seen him before. <laughs> Liz recognized him as being a poacher they'd caught before. He'd not only come 15 miles to set his snares, but had only been out of jail for a month after his last poaching conviction. With the prisoners now securely handcuffed, we retraced our tracks to the water hole, and the game guards fanned out to look for any further snares. They collected 28 in a radius of 50 yards. I asked Terry where on earth all the wire had come from. A lot of snares come from the fencing. The road in this particular area, or the roads in this particular area, are fenced with this oval high-strand steel wire, which is very dangerous because when it kinks, it breaks. And when an animal is caught and thrashes around, it often does kink and breaks, and the animal gets away only to die, or oh, many months later in some cases. Once it tightens, it's there for keeps. It might break away, but the, the, the noose will slowly, over a period of time, eat into the animal. And in many cases, we've had legs severed completely one particular case, um, I was catching down there at the time, we were after wildebeest, and there was, we spotted a bull and chased him, and it was soon obvious that this bull was in no condition to really run away from us. We were in the jeep. As we got close, his, his horns fell off, actually became detached from his head and fell off. And he collapsed, and we came up to him and found that 
he had been caught previously in the snare. Instead of being strangled, the snare had tightened round his, the boss of his horns. And slowly over a period of, it must have been many months, this snare had eaten through his skull. And his horns, in running away from us, had actually fallen off his head. He was still alive, and you could actually see the membranes of the brain pulsating. Of course, there was nothing we could do with him. We had to destroy him. But the cruelty involved here is, is phenomenal. This animal must have gone for many, many months with his head slowly rotting away on top of his brain. And similar, one could go on quoting similar instances. They very commonly come across, or they were. Um, we seem to be checking it now, only because we've been so persistent in poaching control there. But I don't think we'll ever stop it unless the courts sympathize with us more and deal out more severe sentences. Another source of wire, of course, is the pulley cables on the on the sugar machines, the extracting machines. Um, these have a certain lifetime, and once they've been used and frayed, then they're discarded, and these are collected by the various people who've made it their business to sell these snares. They're made up into snares, and they find their way into the bush. Brake cables from train trucks, these are often used. They are cut with pliers from the actual train trucks while they're stationary at the station. Back at the camp, when it was all over and we'd heard each other's versions of the chase, I found myself thinking about Jezebel that amazing old vehicle that had taken so many of us on that chassis-cracking ride. Wondering how many times before she had bashed her way through the bush, I asked Terry. She had done an estimated 140,000 miles, of which about 40,000 were done on the roads, the rest in the bush. Naturally, punctures presented a bit of a problem. Fantastic. We used to get as many as 29 punctures at a time, almost as though it was, there was more wood in the tire than rubber. Apart from that, new tires uh, would last you two or three hundred miles and be written off. They were useless. No, we tried several methods. We tried puncture proofing them one way or another. We tried putting wet skin on the inside and let it harden there. But we found that this frayed the tube too much. Then we tried tubeless tires, but they didn't help much. We got punches in spite of them. And then we decided to try a smaller tire within the tire. In other words, two tires per wheel. And we made the inner, we, we shaved down the inner tire to the extent that it was quite a loose fit in the outer tire. So, so that there would be friction between the yeah. two yeah. Um, in the revolving wheel. Yeah. And, this worked and it. it worked like a charm. The outer tyres would get tremendous quantities of thorns in them, but as soon as the thorns uh, penetrated the first, the outer tyre, they'd be Snapped broken off. off. Mm. The points would be broken off by the uh. inner tyre, which yeah was loose within the outer rim. Yeah. And what happened when you picked up thorns in the bush, you need not necessarily get a puncture from, from them there and then. But as soon as your tire started wearing down, so the thorns got pushed deeper and deeper. Yeah. And the points, as these came through the outer tire, were shaved off yeah. by the inner tire. Well, and we go problem. three, four months now without a single puncture. Terry, has the establishment of Shlani affected your reserve in any way? Well, of course, my beliefs are that there can't be too many game reserves. 
I believe in the distribution of gain. I believe in as many nuclei of the various species being established in many different parts of the country for many reasons. A simple reason is the is one of disease. We might get anthrax through one or some other fatal disease. And if there was only one game reserve and one nucleus, um, there'd be no other area from which to restock. I think in every aspect, game reserves are complementary to each other. Certainly, without the game reserves of the Republic, Lilwan wouldn't be where it is today. We've been aided tremendously by the Natal Parks Board. And this is one of the concepts of conservation, to distribute game all over the place. In this way, the white rhino, for instance, have been saved from possible extermination. It's no longer a species which is endangered simply because of its uh, wide distribution today. We packed camp and prepared to leave for Mlilwan. The final touch to this exciting episode was when, on our way out of the reserve, we encountered a herd of zebra. They dashed off in fright and then, overcome by curiosity, stopped some distance away to turn and stare at us. Liz asked Terry to call to them. He switched off the engine and got out. These then are the game reserves, not only of Swaziland, but of Southern Africa, where the pattern of nature is being preserved, where men like Terence Riley are striving to protect a natural heritage for our children, and for the children of Umzingeli. <laughs> That program on poaching was recorded on location in Swaziland by Paul Bosman and produced by Ronnie Wilson for the Overseas Transcription Service of the South African Broadcasting Corporation.